Good evening. Welcome to this time of evening worship, again through Facebook Live. We pray that God will bless us as we come to his word. We're going to commence this evening by having Psalm 103, stanzas 1 to 4. The psalmist says, My soul, the Lord bless, all within me bless his holy name. My soul, the Lord bless, don't forget all benefits from him. How important it is for us to daily remember the benefits we receive from our God and our Lord. He is the one who keeps us. If only we could remember this every moment of the day, we'd be more inclined to worship, to serve and to honour him and to flee from every sin. We're going to turn then to Psalm 103, stanzas 1 to 4, and we'll sing praise as the psalm is played. again come to God now as we come to him let us pray we thank you O God for the blessings that you bestow upon us we thank you for the mercy which is new to us every day and every time we feel you and fall into sin we thank you that we can come to you O God and find that you are the God who is long-suffering and patient with us so Lord continue to forgive us all our faults, lift up the light of your countenance upon us and continue to draw near to us in all our ways. Heavenly Father, we would come to you in prayer in these days for our society. We think, O God, of the health service in these days when they are being stretched in different ways and when they are not able to carry out some of the needed operations and treatments to help those who have problems with other diseases other than COVID. Lord, we pray that soon you will work in our health service to get things so organized that they will be able to continue bringing the care and the help that is needed to all who are in distress with all kinds of illness. We look to you, O God, for the men and women who serve 
in this way. We thank you for the dedication of so many. And Lord, we pray that you will bless them and use them in their work. We pray, Father, that you will uh, be with those who are in leadership in the health service, those who are managers, that they might seek to organize the affairs in a fair and a good way, and that they would have a real concern to bring the best help possible to all who would need this service. Father, we do pray for our government and for those who make the decisions at that level. We pray, O God, not only for our MLAs in Stormont, but for the MPs in Westminster. O God, give them wisdom. And Father, we cry out to you again this evening that you might cause them to reflect upon some of the decisions that have been made, that they would recognize that the taking of the life of the unborn is, the, is murder, taking the life of a child before it can even see the light of day. Father, speak to the hearts and minds of men and women to show them that we need to abolish this evil from our midst and help them to see, O oh God, that there is a great need uh, in this way and that those who uh, would avail of that not do not need abortion, but they need our love, our care. They need the counsel that would come from those who are full of godly compassion. So gracious God, be at work, we pray, in these days. Father, we also cry out to you that the gospel of Jesus Christ will go forth, that it will be on the basis of our love to God that we would live out our days. O oh Lord, just refresh and revitalize the faith of those who call themselves Christians, that we would be undaunted in the face of those who don't want to hear about Jesus but that we would declare the good news, that we would tell people of their need of our Saviour, and that we would let our lives shine out, that people would know our good deeds, our love for them, our concern, and through that might be brought to seek the Saviour. Gracious God, we cry out to you this evening, to restore and refresh us each day, that our walk with you will be righteous. And now, as we would turn to your word, we pray once again that this word would enliven and quicken us as we think of what its impact should be upon our lives. May we take note and may we learn of it. So, Lord, continue with us now in Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. We have been taking up in these evening uh, messages, study in the book of Judges and we're turning again to Judges this evening. We're going to read this evening from chapter 2 at verse 20 down into chapter 3 at verse 11. So we begin to read in Judges and chapter 2 and we begin to read from verse 20. Let us hear God's word. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the covenant that I laid down for their forefathers and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their forefathers did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not dis drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonites, and the Hivites, living in the Lebanon mountains, from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamath, they were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their forefathers through Moses. 
The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served other served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Beals and the Ashtoreths. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathim, king of Aram Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othaniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rizathim, king of Aram, into the hands of Hethaniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for forty years, until Athenel, son of Kenaz, died. We end our reading there at verse 11, and we pray that God will indeed bless us through his word. I want to turn to think about this word uh, this evening, and we know that there is a pattern in life. Uh, indeed, all of our lives run in a kind of a pattern, but I want to say that there is a pattern even with regards to our life, coming to faith, living for Christ, and then the end. There is that uh, number of things that are evident in most, if not all, who come to know the Lord Jesus. It exists in the lives of all the children of God. And even though we continue to wrestle with sin, the pattern is there. In fact, we might even say that within the Christian life, the pattern we're going to see here in Judges is there even still in a little form. And we need to learn lessons from this portion of God's Word. Today we're coming to the Judges. And we come to the first of the Judges that is mentioned by name, Athenael. We're not given a great number of details about this man. He was Caleb's younger brother, a man who is used by God. And what we see happen in these few verses from uh, verse 7 to verse 11 concerning Athenael is not big in detail, but it shows us the kind of spiritual life of Israel, the repeating cycle of that was going to come. And we see it in other judges, though in some cases we'll see in the future there are more details given about their actions. But here we have a little uh, foretaste, a little uh, in, uh, in capsule of the whole of the experience of the spiritual life. It is the experience of Israel. It breaks up into, I, I think, five different parts First of all, we note in this portion the rebellion against God. There is rebellion against God. We note that as we read these words. The Israelites rebelled against the Lord. Uh, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot their Lord God and served the Beals. There was real rebellion. Here were God's own people, yet they were failing God. They were not doing what they should have been doing. They knew that they should have been serving and honouring God. But instead, here they are, rejecting God, rebelling against Him. Forgetting their God, their true God. Going about in their own way serving their own selfish ends, full of their own importance, thinking that the gods of the world were just as good as the God of heaven who had brought them wonderfully out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, and then into this, the promised land. 
but here they are in rebellion. Now, the Israelites were in rebellion, and that speaks to us of where every person is in this world before they come to Christ. When we think about men and women, we are created by God to worship God and to honour his name. We ought to be looking to the God of heaven from the moment we are born. We ought to be worshipping and serving him. It, we are here because of him. And yet what do we find? We find rebellion. We only have to look around us at our society and we find people who are worshipping the false gods of our day. They are in rebellion against the Creator. They have no time for the living God. Speak to them of the paths of, of the Lord and of morality and all of those things. And they say, I don't care. I will do my own thing. People are rebellious of nature. Indeed, because of the fall, because we are all born in sin, a truth that needs to be got a, getting across to men and women. You are sinful, not because you sin, but because you were born in sin and you are a sinner. And you need to realize that you are in rebellion against God. So the rebellion of Israel speaks of that. But I want to say to those of us who profess faith in Jesus Christ and ask, can you see that that is what you once were? This is what you were before you were converted. Before you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you were a rebellious person. You were in your sin. How you should marvel that God has brought you into his saving grace. Some of us brought up perhaps within the, 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 the confines, within the church, brought to church in Sabbath school from our earliest days, taught the word of God, might be a question, well, we weren't really that rebellious. Perhaps there's no gross evil sin in your past. No great big black marks. But you need to recognize that still, when you were not trusting Jesus, you were in rebellion. We can rebel in many different ways. And one of those ways is simply to live a selfish life, putting on a pretense of religion with no reality or truth. There is rebellion. Do you recognize as a Christian that that is where you were? If you are a believer, I hope you can, because that's the first step to knowing truly the way of God. So there is rebellion. But then the second thing we note in this passage is in response to their rebellion, God withdraws from them. I'm calling this withdrawal by God. Withdrawal by God. In fact, the text tells us that the anger of the Lord burned against Israel and he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rizahathim, king of Aram Naharim. In other words, Rather than fight for them, God withdrew from Israel. He allowed them to be overrun by their enemies. The, the rebellion led to God withdrawing his grace, withdrawing his hand, and allowing them, as it were, to deal with their own lives in their own way, and they made a mess. They just could not deal with the enemy. God was letting them stew in their own juice, as it were. He withdrew. That brought more and more difficulties into their lives. And Israel uh, are fallen into a real place of, of concern. They are under their enemy. They have to give subservience to him. They are not masters of their own destiny, as they might have hoped. Because they've rebelled against God. And so God leaves them to it. Now that is the same for the who's rebellious today. Many people today who rebel against God think that they are in control. They think that they are the ones who are plotting the course and they will do things their own way. 
But the reality is they are actually serving the wicked one. The reality is that they have rebelled against God, and when God withdraws from them, even takes away some of the good things that they might have had, he says to them, Well, if you think you're so great, you get on with it. You make way for yourself. But all the time, it is Satan who leads them, Satan who directs them. They may think that they are directing their own affairs. Indeed, in this world, many of those who rebel against God might get on quite well. Perhaps sometimes they they think they're doing very well. But there is a day coming when they will realize it is all emptiness. Because of nothing beyond this world, they may have a few things in the world, but they can take nothing out of this world with them in the day of death. I wonder, for those who are Christians, have you felt that in your own life? At a time when you were in your rebellion, God was nowhere to be seen. And maybe you came to the point to say, Lord, where are you? Maybe you, in your rebellion, were far from God and realized that in fact you could not cope. You were left to deal with the consequences of your own sin. And that was hard. Maybe you began to realize you were serving the wrong master. Maybe you awakened to the reality that, like Israel, rebelling against God only brought trouble in the long term. Yes, as Christians, we look back and know that some of the things that happened to us were our own fault because of our own sin, because we rebelled against God and he allowed us into that situation. Part of the reason for that comes in the next thing we note here with Israel. In that dire circumstance, Israel cried out to the Lord. They began pleading with God. We read in the text that, verse 9, when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a, a man. It is only when we're brought really low sometimes that we cry out to God. Israel were brought low. They were under a heavy burden from their enemy. They were not masters of their own destiny. All the the wonderful blessings of God seemed far away. And so they were brought to realize the God whom we should know, the God who made us, the God who brought us out of Egypt, This is the God we need to cry to. He is an unseen God, but he has done mighty wonders in the past. Cry to him. And that's what Israel did. They pleaded with God. They pleaded with him for mercy. And I would say to any who are listening tonight who are still in rebellion, who maybe feel that things are not going so well, you need to come back to your creator. You need to cry out to the God of all the earth. You need to ask him for help. You do need to plead with him. Because only he can deal with your situation, with your circumstances. Only he can lead you to a fulfilled, peaceful, blessed life. And indeed, to eternal life. Bow down before him. Cry to Christ the Saviour. Plead with him. We who have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord can look back on that day. It maybe wasn't a particular day or a particular moment, but we know there was a time when we realized we were crying out to God, Lord, help me. I can't live life on my own. I need your strength to do your will. And without you, there's nothing to go forward with, no hope. And many of us, who are Christians can attest to the fact that we came to Christ pleading for mercy, pleading that the pains and destructions of our sins might be removed. And so there's a lesson there to all who are still in rebellion. Cry out to the Lord. Of course, that might pose the question, will the Lord answer? Would God listen to this rebellious Israel? What would he do for them? But we come to know that our God is a loving God, 
Our God is a God who is gracious, long-suffering, slow to anger. And so, of course, God listened to his people. And we find in the fourth place there is mercy from God. We started off in rebellion against God. We noted how God withdrew, let people know what their enemies could do to them. That brought them to the pleading with God and now to receive mercy from God. What wonderful mercy. God actually acts, he says, that he raised up for them a deliverer. God was in action. We could say that in one sense, before Israel even cried out, God in mercy was letting them see how bad things could be. They would be subservient to their enemies. But when they cry out to him, he is not slow, but rather provides for them a deliverer. What mercy! God had entered into covenant. Man had let God down. They had broken the agreement. But God remained faithful to Israel and gave them a saviour, a deliverer. And while we may focus on Athenael as the judge, we should note that it was with God behind him. We just note the words of verse 10. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. Athenael was nothing without God. It was because God in grace stirred up his heart, moved him and guided him to go to war, gave him zeal for service to the Lord. And so God was merciful in providing this Savior. I would say to all who are continuing to rebel today, God has provided a Savior. He has raised up one who is able to deal with your greatest problems, with your deepest sin. You may come really at the bottom of life, feeling that you're past dealing with, past God's mercy. But that's the good news of the gospel. God raised up his son, Jesus Christ, gave him uh, to become a man in the world, Jesus came into the world, lived the perfect life, yet died on the cross and was raised from the dead to become the Savior. And Othaniel, as a judge, points us forward to the great deliverer, Jesus Christ. For it is only through Jesus that you can be delivered from your rebellion. He alone is the the Lord who can take away your sin. How marvellous that is, that he, by his gracious benefits, bestows upon us forgiveness. And he is the only deliverer. We are thinking in the book of Judges of men, men who the Spirit of God came upon. But there had to be a far better deliverer. And that's what Jesus Christ came to do. Not just filled with the Spirit of God, but being the God-man himself. The one who came from God, that you might be delivered. And so in one sense, when we read of Athenael, the deliverer, raised by God, we are directed immediately to Christ. And all who rebel today can turn to Jesus Christ. Jesus has said that whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you come with your pleading, recognizing your fault and the difficulties you're under, then Jesus will receive you. What a wonderful Savior he is. And let me say to those who have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord, don't you know him as the true deliverer? You don't have to look anywhere else, nor is it dependent on upon you and your own strength. Far from it. In fact, when we look to Christ, it is all of him. It is by his strength 
that the believer today lives and is able to go forward and to do that which is righteous and good. What an amazing salvation we have received from our Lord and our Master. God raised up Othaniel, a deliverer. Such mercy. His mercy remains today for all who would seek him. But there is a fifth part to this story, and that is that Israel, under the mercy of God through Othaniel, had peace. We read there in verse uh, uh, at the very end of verse 11, So the land had peace for forty years until Athenael, son of Kenaz, died. What wonderful peace from God. The rebellious Israel had no peace. Before they were at loggerheads with their enemies and they were in rebellion against God. There was no peace either on earth or between themselves and their Lord. But during Athenael's time as judge, there was a real peace. A peace. Now, unfortunately, it's not a peace that lasted, but there was a peace. It was a peace given by God's mercy as the judge continued to keep them on track in the things of the Lord. The land had peace. I would say to those who are continuing in rebellion, you may sometimes think that you have peace. And yet, consider your lives. Have you any real peace? You may have peace on earth, but what about peace with God in heaven? Because if you're still in rebellion in your sin, there is no peace between you and God. In fact, God is your enemy. You have made it so by your rebellion. And in his righteousness and justice, unless you repent and believe and are changed, you cannot have peace with God. But that peace is there for all who would come to him. And it's not a peace that will be short-lived. We read here that this peace was Israel's for the time that Athenael lived. And we know what happens. After this, the cycle continues. After Athenael, the people again rebel. And so the cycle starts all over again. And each of the judges, there is something of these things there. But when we come to the true deliverer, to Jesus Christ, there is true peace, eternal peace. We will continue with Christ and we will always have him on our side. He will make sure that we will always be at peace with God, for he is the advocate standing before the Father to plead your cause. So come to Jesus Christ and find true peace. For those of us who do believe, we know that peace. Perhaps at times we are not very good at living out the peace that should be ours in Christ Jesus. Such is our sinful nature that we sometimes feel to understand the peace that is ours in Christ. We are not what we should be before him. But we know the peace when we return to Christ day after day. We know that with him we will live forever. We know with him we can look forward with hope, real living hope, to eternal life in heaven. So here is a little picture of the salvation of people. We start off with rebellion. Sometimes God withdraws his hand, lets us get on with our sinful lives to show us the utter bankruptcy of all that that is. But then we, we realize, by God's grace, we're brought to plead with him. And when we plead with him, he is merciful. And when he shows us mercy and brings us to the, to the deliverer, we have peace with God. And there is nothing better than to know peace with the living God. But before we finish, let me say to you, to those who believe, is this not what we're like? even as Christians. We must confess 
that we are Israel. We are Israel. And there are days when we live in rebellion to God. We are far from him. His word is not in our hearts. And we make decisions. We do things we know are to be sinful. And sometimes God hands us over to the consequences of that sin and says to us, you think you're managing. Well, let's just see how you'll get on. And we know the bankruptcy that there is when we try to live for Christ on our own and on our own strength. It's empty and useless. How we need to repent and cry out again to God. And how often as Christians do we do that? Daily. Daily we realize our words, our attitudes, our thoughts towards someone else have been wrong. We've rebelled against God. And we need to come to God and plead with him again for mercy. Come back to the Redeemer, the Saviour, Jesus Christ, the Deliverer. And know that by his mercy we have peace. And that's the wonder of being a believer. When we call upon the Lord, he hears us. And he says to us, look, I know you have sinned. But I have, my son has died for that sin. It has been punished, it's dealt with. So go on your way and live for Christ and sin no more. As believers, we ought to be pleading with God every day that we will not rebel, that we would rather serve and follow him. Let me say that not all of these aspects are always going to be there in our lives or evident in in all of people's lives. Sometimes we might not even know the withdrawal of God's hand from us. For he brings us back quickly. Sometimes in our rebellion very quickly we're restored as Christians. But we do need to keep looking on to Jesus. We do need to keep pleading with him. That even our unknown sin might be forgiven. And that we would walk worthy of him. Let me ask. Is that the pattern in your life? Yes we are struggling over sin. May we find Jesus as Lord. When there is little in the world around us to commend or to to encourage us, let's remember the rebellion of Israel. God brought them to their place of pleading. God provided for them mercy in the Deliverer. And God brought them to a time of peace. I wonder, can you identify some aspect of this in your life or with all of these aspects? May it help you to come again with renewed zeal to Jesus Christ to serve and to follow him. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the true deliverer. We thank you that in him we have not just peace but eternal life and the glory that awaits. We rejoice heavenly father that as we open the scripture we are brought again and again back to Jesus for he is the Lord. Forgive us who have rebelled. Forgive our sin. Lead us O Lord in your paths. Speak O God to those who are still in rebellion. And Lord, though you withdraw your hand of your common mercies toward them, may it be to show them the depths of the emptiness of what they have without you. It is nothing. And may they be brought to the place of pleading, seeking your face, crying out for mercy. For you are a God of mercy. And we delight in that mercy and in that deliverer whom you have given, that we might live. So help us to serve Jesus Christ and to follow him all the days of our lives. Lord, hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. In conclusion this evening, we're going to look and sing from Psalm 34, stanzas 1 to 6. What does the psalmist say here? He says, At all times I will bless the Lord. In praise my mouth employ. My soul 
will in the Lord make boast. The meek will hear with joy. That is to be our booster for Christians. It is God who has done it. God who is merciful. We know that the angel of the Lord comes near. The psalmist in stanza 5 verse 8 says, O taste and see, the Lord is good. That's true. Come to Jesus Christ. Cry out to him. And you will find him ready to receive you. Fear him. Don't be distressed. Oh yes, we will find in him that we will lack no good thing. Psalm 34, 1 to 6. We'll praise God together. My Lord, I will. of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and always. Amen. Thank you again for listening. I pray God will bless his word to you.